trigger warnings, safe spaces, microaggressions, unconscious bias and lived experience. The language of therapy is now used widely and indiscriminately. We live in a time where stoicism and rationality are seen as antiquated, harmful even. Instead, we are encouraged to normalise eccentricities and perversions while endlessly focusing on our needs, our emotions, self-care and our inner child. And yet, more and more of us are looking out at our culture and society and feel like we are observing a psychiatric ward. Male rapists in women's prisons, racial segregation in schools, the censorship of books and the rewriting of history. The world's gone mad, many of us cry. But do we even know what madness is anymore? Have our mental health professionals got our best interests at heart? Is sanity still the goal? Or instead, has the psychiatric profession become a battleground for warring versions of reality with the patient sacrificed and made a casualty of the cause? As a mental health nurse, I've worked closely with patients suffering from a wide range of mental health conditions. And while I have experience working with a range of treatments, my real interest is in talking therapies. However, like many, I'm concerned about the radical, harmful and authoritarian ideologies that are destroying this profession. While training to become a psychotherapist at the Tavistock and Portman NHS Trust, I soon became aware that critical race theory was being used to encourage unequal treatments, judgments and generalisations about people based on the colour of their skin. When I spoke up about this and advocated for the colourblind approach of treating people of all races equally as individuals and without prejudice, I was told that this was discredited and outdated. By disagreeing with the view that all white people are racist, I was told that I had created a traumatising environment. Not content with threatening to bar me from the profession of psychotherapy, one lecturer attempted to have me struck off as a nurse, claiming that I had caused race-based harm and was unfit to work with diverse patients. The course lead would later give a pre-written speech declaring that I had made the learning environment unsafe due to my oppressive hate speech. I was subsequently prevented from finishing my clinical work and told not to be present in the clinic's reception area because the sight of my face could cause trauma. Without the generosity of those donating to my legal crowdfund, I would have been left with no way of fighting back and protecting my career. I spoke to Dr. Valerie Thomas about the effects that woke ideology also known as critical social justice, is having on psychotherapy. Once critical social justice is introduced into uh, any arena, it has a totalising and an authoritarian agenda. And its agenda is to um, dismantle and disrupt all the pre-existing approaches to um, that particular uh, arena. So in the case of counselling and psychotherapy, once you introduce CSJ into the um, territory, it goes about, um, um, so it wants to decolonise the field, it wants to remove any um, different view of the human condition. It wants to completely obliterate that. So a really good example would be um, um, different approaches to contentious um, areas of race. So it won't allow any other view than its own anti-racist perspective. So ideas such as colour blindness won't be allowed to exist separately. It will go out of its way to um, uh, demolish and deconstruct um, all the other um, approaches that have those different views. So the end result of CSJ coming into counselling psychotherapy will be um, uh, homogeneity. Mm. 
providing a perfect example of what psychotherapists describe as reaction formation or describing the opposite of what you are doing, the Tavistock racism was presented as fervent anti-racism as it declared itself to be an anti-racist organisation. There's a, a range of third party organisations that have been brought in by universities who are trying to achieve the top ranking as an anti-racist university, as an inclusive, open university on the question of racism. They have lots of overseas students, they have lots of students from ethnic minorities, they don't want to be seen as racist. They bring in organisations who put forward a critical race theory approach to racism. And we know that with that comes all manner of problems, uh, a, a, an inbuilt sense of grievance, a, a, a sense of, set, you know, a, a, an assertion of white supremacy and of white privilege, uh, a guilt uh, to be associated with your skin colour if you're white, an introduction of a victim mentality if you're non-white, and these things, and, and you know, power relations critiqued in a particular way. Uh, in an academic uh, university setting, it's perfectly reasonable to be familiar with those um, theories. In fact, I would advocate that young people would be familiar with them because they're very popular. But they should be familiar with them as a set of theories, not as fact, not as the only policy that counts. And that in fact, if you challenge those theories, you can actually be called out as a bigot, discipline and so on and so forth. So that's the problem with them. If they were introduced as part of an academic package of you know, we should be familiar, as I say, with uh, um, critical theory is a major intellectual movement. I would expect that lots of students, particularly in the humanities, would be familiar with it. But to then say you have to live by that and for a university to think that its status as an anti-racist or inclusive organisation needs to go along with this, I think is very problematic, very dangerous for free speech, a real assault on academic freedom. Unfortunately, my experience at the Tavistock is not an exception. In 2022, a report conducted by Dr. Carol Sherwood and Dr. Kirsty Miller showed that clinical psychology training courses across the UK are encouraging trainees to decolonize traditional evidence-based treatments by removing anything that could be considered white and Eurocentric. Increasingly, mental health professionals are being bullied or denied their careers for disagreeing with woke dogma. You know, I, I hear from trainees who have kind of paused their studies pending the outcome of cases such as ours because they just want to see what the lay of the land is before they continue. Hey, uh, other trainees who literally, and it's causing them a lot of pain inside because they feel that they just cannot speak out, but they desperately need a qualification. And so they're just going to keep their head down. And they feel that they're not being true to themselves, which I think can eat someone up inside. But the alternative is to speak out, to get kicked off and then to lose their livelihood. So some people feel that they don't have an option in that respect. Um, but yes, we have new members joining us all the time, you know, looking for something else. On the flip side, as I've said earlier, there's a lot of therapists out there who have kind of taken on board this ideology and now fully embrace it. And you know, it's quite worrying to see. I mean, I was invited last year to a, a conference by a group called the Society for Existential Analysis to give a general talk about what had happened to me and, and gender identity theory more generally. Um, you know, it's a group of therapists. So one would hope they would be able to handle difficult conversations and, and hear things they don't necessarily agree with. You know, this is part and parcel of what it is to be a therapist. But I was told that there were boycotts of the event. People didn't show up. Um, after my session finished, there was an, what they called an emergency safe space that needed to be held because some therapists were so traumatized by the sight of my face in the building that they couldn't, you know, kind of bear to go on without having a, a, a safe space to debrief in. You know, this, this worries me. It sounds very similar to what's happened to me. It's almost cut and paste. I've been told that I'm unsafe, I'm traumatising these, you know, how this language is weaponised. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hysteria, isn't it? It's, it's, you know, it's an extreme form of catastrophizing and emotionality. It's, it's not healthy response, you know, regardless of the politics or what your 
beliefs are about anything, re reacting, you know, I, I wouldn't react like that to someone who had a different opinion to me on, on anything, really. Like, it's, it's, um, it's extraordinary that mental health professionals are behaving like this because they are the group that you would expect to be able to think and, you know, and ma manage their own emotions. Exactly. The, the, these are the bloody therapists. <laughs> I mean, what, what hope do clients have if their therapist crumbles under the slightest bit of pressure or something that they don't agree with? I mean, you know, it's a fundamental principle of being an uh, ethical counsellor therapist of bracketing your own personal views and beliefs because you're going to encounter clients who think and view the world very differently to you. The origins of psychiatry as we know it today can be traced back to 18th century France. A group of doctors began focusing more on understanding and caring for the mentally unwell rather than just incarcerating them. A century later, neurologist Jean-Martin Charcot, considered the founder of modern neurology, began diagnosing and treating hysteria or excessive emotionality. Charcot would put on displays of his patients during his teaching sessions in Paris. One observer of this was the Austrian neurologist Sigmund Freud. Freud was particularly interested in the link Charcot made between mental illness, trauma and conflicted sexuality. Freud theorised that an impeded or disrupted sexual development was the underlying cause of many psychological issues. He outlined a triangular Oedipal configuration whereby the child has to navigate his or her position, desire and attachment in relation to the parental couple. For Freud, repressed fears and fantasies were the key to understanding human behaviour. Making the unconscious conscious through talking therapy would lead the patient to greater self-awareness and a reduction of symptoms. And so, the 20th century saw a flourishing of various forms of talking therapies. As Freud's practice of psychoanalysis developed, those that followed on from him all differed in their own theories and practices, but they formed a broader tradition of focusing on the interplay between the patient's own inner psychic reality and the reality of the external world. The aim being to identify and understand patterns of thinking and behaving which were hindering or harming the patient. Being able to accept and manage life's harsh disappointments and limitations was a key part of this, and being able to separate subjective feelings from objective facts was vital to healthy functioning and what Freud termed reality testing. However, alongside the development of psychoanalysis, another theoretical framework also began to emerge, one with a very different agenda. Originating in the 1930s, the Frankfurt School were a group of radical far-left academics who sought to merge Freud's psychoanalytic theory with Marxism. This merger would become to be known as critical theory, and it would seek to dismantle and upturn prevailing power structures, as defined from a purely communist perspective. And so, psychoanalysis and psychological concepts and terms more broadly became co-opted by a narrow and extreme political agenda. The most influential among the critical theorists was Herbert Marcuse. Building on Freud's emphasis on repression, Marcuse proposed that a tolerant liberal society should be thought as exhibiting a form of societal repression, a notion he termed repressive tolerance. A truly liberated and unrepressed society could only be realised through communism. And to achieve this would require an intolerance and even violence towards anyone who opposed communism. Alongside this, anxiety and alienation signalled being in contact with the reality of your own oppression, whereas Happiness, belonging and positivity were a sign that you had developed false consciousness and internalised your own oppression. And what was the cure for your false consciousness? To awaken a critical consciousness, to become woke, to become just as resentful and cynical 
as the critical theorists themselves. So, real tolerance is being intolerant, negative thinking is positive, and happiness is oppression. If this all sounds insane, it's because it is. As we know, critical social justice has a genius for rhetorical strategies. And a rhetorical strategy that was used in our field was the positioning of um, critical social justice as a, an evolved form of a previous social justice. And anybody who wasn't on, on board with that was out of date, potentially reactionary. So um, therapists and uh, counsellors generally were sold this, and they bought it. And something that um, myself and my colleagues have really uh, struggled with is that none of our, um, or hardly any of the, the leaders in our field um, stood up um, uh, against this. So there has been no public critique. I mean, for a radically different approach to counselling and psychotherapy. I'm just going to say it again, no public critique. And I find that absolutely astonishing. The critical theorists began to notice a problem preventing their communist utopia. Living conditions had improved so dramatically for the working classes, they lacked a desire for full-scale revolution. In response to this, a shift began to happen. Oppression in economic terms began to be replaced by oppression in relation to identity, namely gender, sexuality and race. In the 1950s, the French Algerian psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Franz Fanon joined the Algerian National Liberation Front. In his writings, Fanon praised the Nazis for resolving Germany's border issues by force. And he urged a similar violent revolution in Algeria to achieve the same cultural purification. During this time, Fanon was making his own contributions to critical theory, specifically on the subject of race, paving the way for the decolonization movement. In keeping with the Marxist separation of people into either oppressors or oppressed, Fanon saw people not as individuals, but as colonizers or colonized. Fanon took the Nazi prejudices applied to Jews, that they were all rich, all powerful, and to blame for all the evil in the world. And he applied this to white Europeans. Um, a denial of, a denial that it's legit, that it's a good thing to treat people as individuals and to take people as we find them, according to what they say and how they act. And instead we see people as ciphers or proxies of a collective identity based on race. And that's, that's really harmful. It's harmful because it's dehumanizing. And when you start dehumanizing groups of people, it then becomes very much easier to politically and in reality treat people in ways that are unequal and cruel and can be very, very dangerous. For Fanon, revolutionary murder is a necessity. Political violence is presented as being therapeutic and the mass killing of Europeans a kind of psychiatric treatment. He describes how the native cures himself of colonial neurosis by thrusting the settler out through force of arms. And what exactly did so-called decolonization look like for Fanon? a complete destruction of political and economic systems brought about through violent genocide. In Fanon's words, decolonization is quite simply the replacing of a certain species of men by another species of men. With contemporary calls to decolonize school curriculums, museums and literature, Psychotherapy has not, unsurprisingly, escaped the decolonization movement. They're conflating the, um, the processes of knowledge accumulation with the processes of imperialism and colonialism in the past. They said, just like the British 
appropriated um, cotton from India and brought it back to Britain, remade it and sold it again, etc. They've done that with knowledge and culture. Um, that's the really fatal flaw. That's why if they do, if you accept that, then what you are accepting that knowledge and ideas and imagination have no reality of their own, which is why I would call it an anti-realist position regarding knowledge and culture, because they're conflating it with political and historical processes. And I think we, there is an analytical distinction to be made. And I think we need to observe that distinction to allow us the freedom to engage in critique. I also think they're wrong historically in their characterization of knowledge, because the idea that <clears throat> um, science or mathematics or um, philosophy, questions about existence, questions about nationhood, have all kind of been, you know, since the Westphalian Agreement in whatever century that was, have all been entirely white Europeans, is patently untrue. You know, you only have to look at the re readings of <clears throat> the nationalist leaders in Africa, the writings of Tagore in India, um, people in Latin America to see that, you know, these ideas were contributed to and engaged with by a wide variety of people across the world. And so, you know, to sort of say that they're white or Western is to me to give up far too much, far too easily to quite a kind of um, limited, quite racist argument, really. Yeah, I mean, when I was at the Tavistock, I was told, uh, one of the lecturers said that psychoanalytic theories are white theories. And I asked, how, how can a theory be white? That, you know, while the person who came up with the theory might be white, the theory in itself, if it's accepted and it has a consensus around it, <coughs> it becomes universal and it's for everyone. Um, and I was told that that was an attack and I'd harmed people for just, for just questioning. Um, it, it's very concerning how race is being attached to ideas and knowledge, where it's almost very, as you say, kind of possessive, that people need to, we can't share ideas, that this is, you know, a white person came up with this idea, so that, you know, that means that only, you know, white people can uh, you know, view it or listen to it or, 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 or yeah. whatever. It's, um, a, it's, it's a real stay in your lane message, isn't it? Yeah. It's, and it, it, it's, I mean, it, it actually, flies in the face of reality today because you know if you actually look at what is happening the kind of cultural hybridity that is is around at the moment the intellectual um excitement that is there to be had from exchanges across across continents across countries is phenomenal the merger of marxism and psychoanalysis marked a change of course with regards to the purpose and use of psychotherapy the original focus of examining the individual's inner life was now making way for a psychology that was focused on telling people to change the world rather than change anything about themselves. One of the things that will be automatically happening through this approach is a, it's like a weakening of the individual who comes for um, treatment. So the, um, the client will, um, will not be encouraged to develop any agency. Everything has been done to them. Thoughts and ideas of um, victimhood and resentment will be encouraged. So they won't be interrogated in any way. And in fact, anything that the client presents is going to be um, supported or endorsed um, without question. So instead of this very strong drive in traditional therapy, which is all about developing insight, insight into the self, insight into others, what happens with um, a CSJ-driven um, agenda is that the insight is given to you. Psychiatry largely determines diagnosis based on the individual's relationship with reality. But how exactly is reality being defined? It seems there is an increasingly narrow concept of reality, which is less about what is objectively true and is more concerned with diagnosing those who have dissenting views. There is a historical precedent for this. In the Soviet Union, those who disagreed with the regime were incarcerated in psychiatric facilities 
And those protesting for reform were diagnosed as having delusions of reformism. Now, while we are quite facing this level of corruption within the mental health profession, there is a growing concern in the way psychology is being used to push a political agenda, wield power and pathologise disagreement. It's a very, very strange moment in time that we have now where the idea of, you know, that kind of pursuit of truthful knowledge is seen as dangerous um, and dangerous in a particular way. It has been seen as dangerous in the past politically because it can unsettle truths that people in power have used and have needed to maintain their position. But today, as you, as you point out, it's seen as psychologically damaging, the very idea of questioning, some, uh, questioning um, an orthodox belief uh, is seen as somehow equivalent to damaging the person holding that belief. So um, it's now um, understood that it is uh, acceptable for um, uh, therapists to use manipulative tactics um, in, in order to bring the, ther the, um, the client round to their agenda. And when I looked at the guidelines that were issued by the American Psychological Association in 2017, and these are the guidelines for multicultural practices. They are completely explicit that it's um, crucially important that the therapist helps their client start to engage with identity talk. So no matter what the client is bringing, the, um, the therapist believes it's important to get the client to examine the role that, an ident that their identity plays in the difficulties that they're bringing. And it suggests that you can use therapeutic skills to overcome the client's resistance to shifting the focus of the conversation away from their own issues to um, um, issues of identity. I mean, this is, this is a complete reversal of the, um, the, 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 ethic, the ethics of um, uh, psychotherapy and counselling, mm -hmm. where it's always the client's agenda that takes precedent. In 2019, the American Psychological Association issued guidelines to supposedly improve men's mental health by declaring traditional masculinity to be psychologically harmful. They specified achievement, adventure, risk-taking and anti-femininity to be part of this harmful constellation. Similarly, recently published APA guidelines to clinicians outline that children should lead the way in carving out their own self-descriptions and assignments of gender. These categorizations include gender-fluid children, gender smoothies, gender by season children, and gender by location children. It may be worth noting at this point that there has been a significant demographic shift amongst psychologists since the early days of Freud and Jung. Around 70 to 80% of psychologists and psychotherapists are now female. Look man, Freud was no dummy. When he pointed to the fact that the devouring mother was one of the major impediments to proper human development, he knew that, mm. looking deep into the darkest families and seeing this proclivity of the overprotective mother to destroy the developing integrity of the child, to keep the child infantile, to cling to that relationship instead of developing a life for herself and letting the child go flourish. That's Hansel and Gretel. I mean, I guess it's interesting, isn't it, to think from a psychological perspective as to why so many people are drawn to woke ideology. Mm -hmm. um, I often see that a lot of these activists seem to be very unhappy and in a lot of pain. Um, and it seems as though woke ideology gives them an outlet for their anger and their resentment. Um, and I guess certainly at the Tavistock, as some of the people that were sort of bullying me, it seemed to be to me that they were very damaged. Mm. And of course, if you have experienced some kind of trauma, you would feel anger and resentment. Mm. But I guess what I notice is that woke ideology or critical social justice, it doesn't bring about healing. 
it, yeah. it keeps you in that state of anger mm. or mm. upset. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, just to pick up on your last statement, it, it isn't a healing practice. It's a political practice. And um, uh, certainly from my perspective, it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's actually a toxic practice. Um, so it's the exact opposite, it's anti-therapeutic. You know, I had a client when I was still practicing who had seen other therapists before, and generally the message he was being given, he said, was that um, he didn't really have much to complain about because he was in the privileged position of being a straight white man. Mm. And actually he had plenty to complain about. He had, a lot of, he had a lot of crap going on in his life that he needed to unpack. But the message from society is he was privileged and he should step aside and actually let someone speak who's got real problems. And I think that can only be encouraging like mental turmoil in people. The 1950s saw the discovery of antidepressant and antipsychotic medications. Alongside this, diagnoses became more specific and formalised. The American Psychiatric Association published the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and to this day it remains the leading authority for psychiatric diagnosis. The original DSM contained 106 distinct psychiatric diagnoses. Five editions later, this has since increased to 298. In 1980, gender identity disorder was introduced as a diagnosis and the Tavistock's Gender Identity Service, GIDS, was set up 10 years later. In 2013, gender identity disorder was replaced with the term gender dysphoria this change occurred in response to political pressures claiming that the term disorder was stigmatising. From as early as 2005, staff at the Tavistock Gids Clinic were expressing concerns about the use of experimental medical treatments being used on children experiencing dissatisfaction with their biological sex. Internal reports outlining the lack of research around prescription of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones were ignored. Safeguarding whistleblowers were bullied and put through disciplinary procedures. Similarly, those in the public eye who were the first to speak out were turned on by the media and ostracised by their peers. But I just kind of thought, well, once people find out that children are being uh, told that they will become um, you know, boys are being told they will become girls if they if they cut off their penises, and and girls are being told they will become real boys if they cut off their breasts. Uh, once they find out that the the medical complications that come with taking cross sex hormones like testosterone um, for for girls, uh, you know, the side effects include osteoporosis. Um, early menopause everyone who's on testosterone all these women who are on testosterone will go into early menopause 30 years too early in some cases um multiple sclerosis is um is associated with uh, men taking cross-sex hormones so i thought well all you have to do <laughs> is tell people about all this and um it will uh you know it will gather momentum and people will try and stop it but that was six years ago nearly, and uh, no one did. No one seems to care. Proper scrutiny of the Tavistock only came when a former patient, Kira Bell, brought a legal case against the clinic. Kira was prescribed puberty blockers when she was 16 and went on to have her breasts surgically removed. She later regretted going through these irreversible procedures. Like many, she came to understand her mental distress as being the result of a range of issues rather than being born in the wrong body. Kira Bell's judicial review led to the 2020 High Court ruling that under 16s were unlikely to be able to consent to puberty blockers. Subsequently, the UK government instructed esteemed paediatrician Dr Hilary Cass to take an objective look at the Tavistock's gender services. The findings of the CAS review aligned with many of the concerns raised by whistleblowers. That an evidence base for an affirmation only model was severely lacking and that the use of puberty blockers came with many risks. Following this outcome, the Tavistock Gids Clinic was closed, leaving many wondering why it took the government so long to act. 
But on the Tavistock, they then think it's an NHS clinic full of experts. You trust them. You would think, wouldn't you? And they are told by whistleblowers there's a problem, but it's an area that they feel difficulty in intervening in. Now, if that's what the Conservatives feel like, then the Labour Party, who are much more prone to embrace a lot of the diversity orthodoxies with even less thought, I don't hardly need mention the Lib Dems and the Greens. And that's kind of your political class, right? And, you know, I don't really count. I'm just like a, a, a non-affiliated, relatively new peer in the House of Lords that, let's be honest, is a bit of a maverick. So the, 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 there aren't enough mavericks in a way. And also political parties in general have become stuffed with technocrats, careerists, all sorts of, you know, there's a real collapse of uh, a political class of people with great integrity, open-minded, independent thinkers that used to exist within parties. And now that doesn't really uh, feature. And so consequently, you do get people just nodding along to things. But I think it's been a great, it's again, a great indictment of the political parties and the political le leadership of this country that allowed the Tavistock issue to continue. Just one quick final point is, I think when they started to hear about it, they then thought, oh my God, now we're going to get blamed. You know, can you imagine a situation where it's your worst nightmare, right? Your worst nightmare. You think you're doing the good thing and everyone will love you for it. And then some people start to imply that you have set up a medical facility that is actually institutionally offering abusive, medically abhorrent practices on children that will cause enormous psychological, if indeed not physical damage. You don't want to accept responsibility. You, so you think that can't be true. It can't be true. But because you have trusted the medics, because I think that you would, it, you just want to look the other way. And I think that they just look the other way until they were absolutely forced to stare it in the eyes and stare it in the face. Mr Speaker, thank you. The CAS review interim report found that to date there's a profound lack of evidence on the best approach to treat gender dysphoria in children. Does my right honourable friend share my concern that in spite of this, the NHS insists on making a child's express gender identity the start point for treatment and also my surprise that the NHS has chosen so far not to track patient outcomes, particularly for under-18s. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I do share my honourable friend's concerns and that is why the NHS commissioned this review from one of our top paediatricians. It is already clear to me from her interim findings and from the evidence, uh, other evidence that I've seen that the NHS services in this area are too narrow, they are overly affirmative and that in fact they are bordering on ideological. You know, the Tavistock closed down in the UK. That was the big gender surgery performing institute in the UK. How, which how was that closed, closed down? down? What happened? Government closed it down. So yeah, the because they knew that they, they figured out in the UK that, wow, the rates of transgender transformation requests were skyrocketing. And even the people at the clinic knew that they were rushing people along the transformation pipeline way faster than they should have without proper clinical evaluation. What? There's a thousand lawsuits out against the Tavistock in the UK now. Wow. A thousand. But like it's, you know, if you tell a child that it's even possible they were born in the wrong body, that is grooming because it's not true and you're implanting a dangerous idea in a child's head. So I think grooming has always been the perfect word for what's going on. We're all being groomed into accepting things that we shouldn't be accepting. Another example is children's books written by so-called queer uh, creators. Um, you know, they keep slipping in uh, drawings of, of women, of young uh, people with double mastectomies. Yeah, yeah. Just the little stitches on the chest. And uh, this is portrayed as the most wonderful inclusion, you know. And what it's actually doing is, is normalizing the idea that uh, you can find your true self through mutilation. One of the most shocking details of the Tavistock GID service was that around 80% of the children placed on a medicalised pathway were gay. Reportedly, there was a dark joke at the Tavistock that soon there will be no gay people left. 
And yet, such regressive and harmful ideas were being pushed by people claiming to want to promote inclusivity, care and compassion. The staff at the Tavistock seemed to be unable to question and stand up to ideologically driven external organisations such as transgender charity Mermaids, reportedly due to the fear of being labelled as bigoted. I met a young lady called Kira Bell. She was a lesbian. She was a lesbian who told me the horrific experience that she had in the Tavistock Clinic. It was an eye-opening experience. I know that the member for Kirkcaldy and Cowden Beath talked about transing away the gay in his speech uh, in Westminster Hall debate. We are seeing, I would say, almost an epidemic of young gay children, young gay children being told that they are trans and being put on a medical pathway for irreversible decisions and they are regretting it. That is what I'm doing for, for, for young LGBT children. I am, making sure, I am making sure that young people do not find themselves sterilised because, they because they are being exploited by people who do not understand what these issues are. It seems to me as though organisations like the Race Equalities Charter and Stonewall, they're almost acting like a sort of protection racket in the institutions um, don't want damage to their reputation, so they pay money for these organisations to come in so that they can say that they're progressive and they're anti-racist. Um, and then these organisations essentially set about you know, bullying staff and students into confessing their white fragility and all sorts. I guess I'm curious as to how a movement which seems to be about um, what well, money making, but also oppressing workers and students and infringing their rights when they don't have the power to fight back, how that can consider itself to be progressive or left wing. It seems well, to be the opposite. It does, seem, it does seem the opposite. And, you know, I'm from a left wing background. I think probably the word progressive, I mean, I think I probably would have always considered myself to be progressive, but now it's such a tainted term. The term left uh, wing is, is tainted as well. Increasingly, people across the political spectrum are realising the tyrannical nature of critical social justice. It is not only preventing good psychological treatments, but is often contributing to a worsening of mental health. It is unclear at this point whether the profession can survive and return to sanity. Often held up as a genius of the 20th century, Sigmund Freud's statue sits here outside the Tavistock. One can only imagine what he would make of all the harm, malpractice and lawsuits going on behind him that have left his practice of psychoanalysis hanging in the balance. In terms of the fight, I think in the UK we've kind of won already. We've kind of, um, we've reversed, you know, the fact that mermaids are under statutory investigation is fantastic. The fact that Tavistock closing is fantastic. There's more, um, there's more scrutiny on how we get got here and so as a result the kind of uh, uh, completely incoherent set of beliefs that these people have is being exposed. There's something that remains constant for me and the constant thing is that um, uh, the, the drive to, for healing is a universal drive and it seems to operate across all societies and as far as we know you know all, all historical periods and there's a vocation to um, offer um, succor, psychological help um, to people who are suffering. So no matter what happens to our professions, um, that drive to heal will still exist, but it will take new forms.